Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is the second panel and we'll be uh, talking about views from academia. In this uh, field of law, you'll see that uh, the ivory tower is very close to the courtroom. Uh, and uh, our first speaker uh, will be Professor Michal Barzuza from the University of uh, Virginia uh, Law School. Um, Michal will talk about a topic that everyone's talking about now, uh, ESG, but what really drives uh, corporations and uh, top executives in corporations to actually, actually be sensitive to uh, ESG, ESG trends. This is exactly your uh, research project. And uh, in the interest of time, I will ask you and the next speakers in this panel to try to condense their uh, talks to 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so wonderful uh, to be back here in this always uh, excellent uh, conference that Zohar organizes. Uh, so, um, as Ido said, I'm going to talk about this G. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, there's, there's no uh, a debate anymore about the significance of the rise of ESG. Um, there are different views of, over whether it's good or bad. Some are optimists, some are uh, skeptic. Uh, the, there's a range of views. Uh, most of them, I would say, fit uh, the ESG story uh, into existing frameworks. Uh, and what we are doing in this project um, is uh, to argue that something has changed and to explain why this change is significant and how it kind of diffused and penetrated into corporate governance and especially into the incentives uh, of the corporate governance players. Um, and uh, we focus on uh, the behaviors and the preferences and also the reputation, which might not be uh, uh, real, but the reputation of the young people, the young generation, the millennials, um, and primarily their inclination or willingness to bring their values to their work, to what they buy, to where they invest, um, to walkouts and cancel cultures, to broadcast these uh, events uh, broadly, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, um, to, to kind of be quite confrontational with management and firms about it. Now, we're not talking about all millennials, and, uh, but we do think that there is asymmetry between left and right in the sense that the left-leaning millennials have more inclination to do that. And what we argue is that because this generation was kind of willing to bring, because we had other you know, um, movements, social movements in the past, but they were less uh, integrated in, in the economy. Because this generation is, was willing to bring these values to what they buy, to where they invest, uh, to, to cancel and, and walk out uh, uh, on managers and CEOs, uh, this has created a significant set of incentives, of pressures, through five different channels uh, that pressure managers to invest significantly in ESG. Now, we are not saying it's, it's necessarily good, not at all, and I'll get to that, but, but in difference from the past, this time, we argue, it's not just smoke and mirrors. It's a real thing. It's a force to be reckoned with. And we see money flowing, you know, we see uh, 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 hundreds of billions of, of dollars going into ESG investment and so forth and so forth. So it's consistent also with what we are viewing. Uh, but we're trying to explain why this time it is a force to be reckoned with, and at the same time, uh, it's not necessarily optimal because there are different newly created agency problems in this new world. So the first is I'll just say, you know, we are not, this is not just a theoretical argument. So here is the, pre the former president of the Business Roundtable saying our announcement of the Business Roundtable was in part also directed at millennials that were kind of frustrated from capitalism and so forth. It was on our mind. We did it right after there was this uh, a very significant survey showing the results that millennials really prefer, uh, pr uh, prioritize their values over uh, returns. So really what we are, uh, this kind of summarizes our, our argument. We are, what we are arguing is 
there are five different channels through which the millennial influences, or which is now even more than millennials, right? Uh, uh, or, or the social pressure operates and penetrates inside the firm and affects management incentives. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, go through them. But the point is, there are five, okay? So even if we doubt one of them, or two of them, or three of them, there are five. So uh, the first one is through the markets. So this is uh, managers, uh, many management managers, index funds, Larry Fink, everyone is saying ESG is good for profits. Uh, if you don't provide ESG, you cannot hire employees, you're gonna pay them more. You'll have to, uh, you have difficulty selling your product and so forth. To some extent, this is true. There is evidence on that. Um, it's going to be more and more difficult to succeed if you are not offering uh, board diversity, workforce diversity, if you, um, your climate um, policies are poor and so forth and so forth. So on this channel, this is just managers that maximize revenues will invest in ESGs for the benefit of the firm and the shareholders. And this is one channel, it's an important channel. But uh, we actually think it's not the one that provides the strongest incentives. Because managers' alignment with shareholder value exists, but, it, but is limited to some extent. Uh, but, but this channel is important also because it provides justification for managers and for index fund managers to invest in ESG, to be, act, to be activists on ESG, even in cases when it's not good for shareholder value. Because there's a lot of evidence that you need to do it to some extent. And we don't really know to what extent, right? Uh, but you have some evidence to rely on that, and frequently, you know, Black or Clary Fink, they all cite to the evidence on how ESG promotes uh, shareholder value, consumer consumption, employees, and so forth. And as I said, there is evidence, we can talk about it uh, later. Uh, okay, the second channel is this young generation willingness and ability to, to make a lot of noise, to do walkouts, to broadcast these walkouts. Now, this actually, for shareholder value, on the firm level, is not that significant. It's diversifiable, cancel culture happens, but it doesn't always cause that significant uh, uh, damage to profits. Uh, um, and you know, in, the, in a diversified portfolio, it's actually not that significant. However, it is very significant on the personal level of the CEO who is being targeted. CEOs ha had to step down one after another because of negative ESG news. There are tons of examples which other CEOs follow closely for sure. And we know that even just these examples could have you know, a large impact, regardless of the probability, on the individual CEOs whose risk is not diversifiable for their career trajectory, right? Uh, second, there's actually evidence now that negative ESG news are associated with higher CEO turnover, with less success in the, in the next job, and so forth and so forth. So it's a clear, direct, personal risk to the CEO. One. Two, this risk for the CEO himself is not diversifiable. And here is the first agency problem between the CEO and the shareholders. Shareholders might not want to, to, the company to invest too much against cancelled culture. But the CEO personally does have these incentives. And three, really important, investment in ESG is not coming out of CEO's packets. It's coming out of the firm resources. So here uh, is an, uh, an opportunity to reduce personal risk using firm resources, uh, and this risk is not diversifiable, this clear uh, agency problem, skewed incentive, to actually uh, maybe excessively invest in ESG. Third, the third channel is through the index fund. The index funds, and that was established in the literature, the index funds managers really care about asset under management about funds flow. They care less about shareholder value. They care less about doing things that will increase the value of the stock or, or decrease it because if they do this, it will do it also for the other funds. It doesn't provide competitive advantage and so forth. 
So they really want to attract flows. They tried for years, but they had no opportunities to distinguish themselves. They reduced fees, reduced fees, reduced fees, no other ways to compete. Suddenly, they realized that there are at least some investors that, ha that have particular preferences, and these investors care about ESG, and they, want, and they have a demand for ESG. And this is an opportunity to attract flow, and also a risk to lose flow. And once they realized that, they started to work really hard to position themselves as ESG supporters. Because in this type of competition, if you lose, it could be big. Uh, uh, and if you win, it could also be big. So, so uh, Larry Fink, you know, invents this thing so much in portraying BlackRock as a leader in ESG, uh, the other funds, uh, State Street on diversity, and so forth, okay? Uh, activism from the index funds, we all know, uh, uh, on diversity, on, on climate, has been effective, has been vigorous, very different from everything we saw with respect to, uh, uh, um, from everything we saw with respect to governance, um, much more confrontational, voting against board members, and so forth, and so forth. Also here, though, there is an agency problem, because as I said, the index funds care about the flow. They care less about the value, about the shareholder value. So if I, as, a, as an index fund manager, have incentives to uh, uh, become the leader, right, and, and position myself uh, as a brand of ESG, uh, I also have incentives sometimes to compete aggressively to that extent even at the expense of, of shareholder value because this is how my set of incentives is structured. And we saw it with, with respect to diversity. State it started and said, uh, we are gonna demand one female, uh, uh, BlackRock continue, we're gonna demand two. State it said, we're gonna vote against the entire committee. BlackRock. We, we see this type of competition, actually with respect to this example, I think it is efficient, but the incentives that we see are definitely skewed and could lead to excessive push for, for ESG. Uh, fourth channel is the activist hedge funds. So there was an argument that, that managers are gonna use the ESG uh, um, against the activist hedge funds. The activists probably read this argument and kind of out clever that and started to use the ESG against uh, management uh, by using it to leverage, get the index funds, is it for me? Or? The noise? No. Okay. <laughs> I thought maybe it's uh, against, the, against the index fund, uh, 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 pushing the buttons of the index fund managers, knowing that once Larry Fink wants to position himself as the leader of ESG, right, voting in BlackRock uh, against their candidates who are climate experts, right, in a, in a publicized fight, you know, could create reputational damage for Larry Fink. Uh, so very cleverly utilizing that to get the index fund support to their candidates uh, on the board. Now this, this, this channel of the, in the, of the, of the uh, hedge fund activism adds another type of incentives for CEOs to invest in ESG, which is also uh, qualitatively different in the sense that Activist hedge funds are experts in finding weaknesses, in finding vulnerabilities. So now, if before the manager had incentives to invest maybe a little bit too much against in, in the climate and so forth, to be on the safe side that he's doing, that he's not risking himself, now actually the managers have another layer of incentives to look within for ESG vulnerabilities, okay? So if, if they were not sure if they should do it or not, you can see here a memo from Scadden, the common proxy season company should be wary of the so-called toy and horse campaign and where activists combine ESG initiatives with traditional activism campaign. Uh, and uh, here's another uh, fortune warning, diversify your board or activist investors may weaponize the issue. So again, here's another uh, 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 a whole set of incentives to start to look within uh, your ESG to invest in it, company money, in order to avoid being targeted by uh, an activist. Lastly, the last channel is regulation. There were lots of discussions about whether uh, if, if there is uh, um, 
stakeholderism on the company level, it will preempt regulation. We think that actually the, the opposite is happening. The demand for ESG that is pronounced on the company level is actually also facilitating regulation in the field for several reasons. One, uh, those that demand ESG also pressure firms to disclose their lobbying expenses. One of the reasons the index fund supported the, the uh, um, in the Exxon uh, mobile uh, uh, competition, one of the reasons that the um, index fund supported the activists in Engine One was because they were worried that Exxon did not disclose its lobbying expenses and that they were, they were worried that they were not consistent with uh, Exxon support, public support of the Paris Agreement. So, so a strong pressure to decrease lobbying expenses that were uh, are directed against regulation in favor of the environment and so forth. Second, in terms of cost benefit analysis of the regulator, the SEC you know, had an easier way for the cost benefit analysis for its last climate disclosure rule, why? Because one, it's easier to show benefits, there's so much demand for it, they, they cited for the fans, index funds demand for that as benefits. Two, uh, the costs are lower because so many firms are already doing that. And why so many firms are already doing that? Because of this pressure from the ground. So actually we think that this, this kind of uh, phenomenon and pressure from the ground and the adoption on the firm level is facilitating regulation rather than uh, preempting it. And we see that also in, in Europe happening a very similar. So in Europe, the uh, Secretary uh, Esther McVeigh says uh, young workers increasingly question their pensions. So this is how they also kind of modifying rules and so forth. Okay, so the bottom line, uh, uh, what do we think normatively? And here we want to be careful, but we definitely think there are benefits to the Millennium Corporation uh, and, and there are uh, costs to the Millennium Corporation, but even before that, this is a significant uh, thing. It's not like the, what happened in the past where the managers adopted other constituency statutes and th this was the only example that we had for stakeholderism. Uh, it, it's a much more significant force that is happening. And, and we should look at it this way. Uh, and we should therefore also look into the different incentives of the different players. So the, benef the benefits are that there are, uh, in, uh, uh, consistent with, with, with what I said, there are achievements. Whereas in the past we didn't have any achievements for stakeholderism, there are clearly results. Diversity has increased significantly, more diversity. The last year, 72% uh, of the new nominations were from minorities. Uh, the uh, Black Lives Matters protests after the murder of George Floyd have doubled the nominations of, of uh, Afro-American uh, board members uh, and so forth. So important achievements that we didn't have before. It's a lot. Uh, uh, we, we, we used to have no real changes to, to corporations. Uh, achievements also with climate, with disclosure, with workplace environment, and so forth. Now, in the past, people used to say, we should leave this to regulation. We should leave the climate to, to climate environmental regulation. We should leave uh, uh, diversity to other regulations. This should not be within the firm. However, there were no rules. Uh, there were no regulations for decades and decades, and there were reasons for that. First and foremost, because firms could lobby and use a lot of money to lobby against these regulations. So, so, so Jean Tirole, when he wrote his first uh, 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 influential paper on, on uh, social responsibility said, as an economist, you know, I know that also regulation is captured and I, I actually do not think that we can leave these issues to only to rules and they should be treated within the uh, company. There is a, a, a consideration of maybe pro-social preferences that now economists uh, argue we should have. And in terms of governance, uh, we actually think that managers uh, uh, have maybe less power, more discipline as a result of this wave. Uh, they are not more entrenched, they are less entrenched as a result of the CHEs. It's a significant demand which they are responding to, succumbing to. It's not their initiation. Now, what are the perils of, of uh, ESG? As we said, the incentives, when you look at them seriously closely, are to some extent skewed. 
CEOs have clearly incentives to invest a lot in ESG. I am actually surprised that they don't do it more. The risk is huge. Uh, 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 and they can really, you know, use the corporate resources to reduce this risk. Uh, and uh, um, I think that, you know, right now the risk is really for the most negative event, which probably keeps it from, from being, uh, you know, huge money uh, pour being poured into this. But, but their incentives are there to make real investments for sure. It's, this is very clear. Second, index funds uh, have strong incentives to be active on ESG, and the incentives of the index funds are not necessarily uh, optimal. They may push too aggressively uh, at the expense of shareholders, expense of other uh, stakeholders, which is all maybe we'll talk about. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, we might see also here too aggressive uh, uh, push for that. Uh, third, activist hedge funds have incentives to leverage on that and to push the index funds uh, buttons, even for issues that the index funds are not interested in, in which we saw in the last Carl Icahn uh, uh, examples with uh, Kroger and uh, McDonald's. Um, and lastly, I think we should keep a different separate category for the CEO political activism for where the, the, young, now, the young people now are actually took it another step they realize how much power the company have, and they're trying to use this power to promote their own political goals, as they, as they did in, in Disney and so forth. I think this is a separate category, which is more complicated, uh, and, and that could raise more, more difficulties. Um, in terms of governance, increased power for, for the activist hedge funds, uh, which is uh, not necessarily good always. Uh, uh, they have uh, their own problems. Uh, and also, uh, to some, in some cases, maybe managers can also keep using for their own benefits, as they, it seems like they're still doing with respect to uh, acquisitions. Of course, there are also practical difficulties. It's pretty messy. There are different rankings, and they're confusing, and they're not uh, very uh, uh, consistent, and so forth. Uh, however, uh, it's here. It's significant. It's coming through all these channels. Uh, uh, the incentives are there. Um, and there are agency problems. And it might uh, uh, get to be excessive as a result.